God, this is um, exciting, Lord. I just thank you for your word. It's living, it's powerful, Father. Uh, let us realize that as Christians, we need to be informed, that we need to be able to give an answer uh, for those people who ask us a uh, reason for the hope uh, that we have in you, Lord Jesus, and in your word, God. And may we be willing to do that, Father. Let us realize that as Christians, we don't need to be ignorant. We don't need to fear science. We need to realize science just confirms what your word says states, that our foundation is always going to be God's word, and as we see, science supports it, Lord. So as we dig into this, God, uh, open our mind to that, and uh, let us do that work within our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. So open your Bible to uh, Genesis 1. We'll be looking at 14 through 19, and I'd like to read, and then we're going to see a little video here. Then God said, let there be lights in the firmament, or the expanse of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. We're going to talk about that quite a bit. And let them be for lights in the firmament or the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them in the expanse or in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the, fir- were the fourth day. So let's watch the video as we take off. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven." to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. It was so. And God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day.
firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Pretty good, huh? It just puts a really great context to the words that we just read when we see that visual. You know, last week we had Botany 101. This week we're going to have Astronomy 101. We're going to go into that a little bit next week as we look at the Big Bang and we look at what the uh, secular evolutionist state of the world uh, came about, the universe came about. Um, we will be talking about ichthyology and ornithology in a couple weeks when we get into the birds and we get into the uh, fish. But this morning, we're going to realize the whole fourth day, the fourth 24-hour period, literal 24-hour period, is focused on one thing, and that's planetary space. I want you to get that, the big overview. Got it? It's focused on that one aspect, the creation of the sun, the moon, and the stars. The simple fact of God's creation is more, I think, amazing, I'm overwhelming, awesome, when we start looking outwardly at the greatness of God's universe. We're going to see that when we look at the inwardness towards the cell, we're going to see how amazing it is also. But I want to make sure we understand the same terminology, so um, that we're all speaking the same language, that when somebody talks to you about solar system or galaxy or the vastness of the size, I want you to be the one to have the information. I want you to be the knowledgeable one in the conversation. But the numbers start becoming so big, we have a hard time, I have a hard time, wrapping my brain around the immensity of these numbers when we talk about the solar system and galaxy and the universe. And I want to make sure you understand the difference between what I mean by solar system, galaxy, and universe. We have a slide here that's going to talk about what's called our a planetary system here. A planetary system is a system in which there is a sun, there is a star that has a gravitational pull. And the gravitational pulls pulls planets to what? Orbit the star. We have a star. We call it our sun, our soul. We have eight planets. We used to have nine. We lost Pluto. I'll talk about that. We have eight. What happened to Pluto? He was my favorite Disney dog. No, that's something different. Here we go. So we have eight, eight planetary uh, objects going and rotating, um, revolving, I should say, around our uh, sun. It's able to stay in orbit because of the gravitational pull of the sun, and it's able to stay in orbit because the speed, the velocity of which it travels around the sun. I want you to understand that. If you have a little ball, you know those little things that you used to eat, and you go bump, 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 and go back and forth like, like that, right? Let's say you cut it off, or let's say you just start swinging it. Whoa! You know what I mean? And then the band breaks. What happens? It goes shooting off on a tangent in a straight path. In other words, the only ways in that thing hangs on is by the skin of its chinny-chin rubber band, right? Well, that rubber band pulling it is called gravitational force. And it's an inward-seeking force that pulls objects in. All matter has gravity. The larger the object, the greater the gravity. We, as an Earth, also has gravity. And we have something that we are going, woo, woo, around. What is it that's going around the Earth? It's not a trick question. It's the moon, okay? So we're all going to be learning the same thing this morning, okay? So the moon also goes around the Earth because the Earth has a gravitational pull, Right? on the moon, and if that little gravitational pull would stop, the moon would go, what? Woo! Right, right on out. And that would really be devastating for the earth because of all the things that we depend upon the moon. <clears throat> Our planetary system, I'm going to use the word planetary system, is called the soul system, or it's also called the solar system. 
I mean, the name of our planetary system is called solar system, but we also use the word solar systems to speak of planetary systems. People say, are there other solar systems out there in, in the universe, people will ask. When they say, are there other solar systems, are there other planetary systems out there, what they are asking is this, are there other places in the universe where there is a star, where there is a sun like we have, a star, that has what? Objects revolving around it? The answer is yes, and we'll talk about that, just so you know. Pretty amazing, huh? Well, we have eight different ones that go around, and there's a little pneumatic device that we use. My very educated mother just served us noodles. <clears throat> My stands for what? Very educated mother just served as noodles, and they used to serve us plentifully, which stood for what? But Pluto doesn't exist anymore. Just wanted to, what happened? What happened? What happened to Pluto? In 2000, and it died. Yeah, in 2006, they started looking at what they call the reasons for planetary uh, movement around, and there's three criteria. Pluto didn't meet one of the criteria of the three criteria, so it was removed. Did Pluto leave? No. You need to realize. Our moon is larger than Pluto, just so you know. And so, just to get the, the, the graph aside. Well, it's very hard to, to, to figure out what distances are. Let's pop up the next slide. If you look at the next slide, <clears throat> this gives us some, some uh, distance measurements. The distance from Earth, right here, to the sun is 93 million miles. Now, that's that's, you know, when we say somebody's a millionaire, we think they're rich. When we see somebody's a billionaire, they're what? Really, really rich. I don't know if we have any trillionaires or quadrillionaires. You hear what I'm saying? Because it just gets, the numbers get kind of silly in our brain. And so here's 93 million miles. I want you to realize, from Earth to Neptune is 2.7 what? Billion miles. Billion. There's a thousand millions in a billion. You got that? So that's 2.7. So this is just almost another 100 million. So the distance from the sun over to Neptune is 2.8 billion miles. They estimate that our solar system is about 3.7 billion miles in a radius. And the reason I say radius is because if this is the sun, and that's 3.7 miles, at, and there a billion miles out to where Pluto, let's say, is, that it's also, when it orbits around us, what? 3.7 miles on the other side. Got that? Because they all orbit what? The sun, not the laser, the sun, yes. And so they all go around it and around it. And that is very, very big. We're talking big numbers. When the Apollo 11 mission landed on the moon, we had Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, those of you that were around back then, the first one to, to step on the moon. There was a space race that was going on with the Soviets at that time. And in response, <clears throat> the Soviets announced that they were going to launch a spacecraft to the sun. Uh, in response to us landing on the moon, the Americans said, it's not going to work. You're going to get three mile, million miles away from the sun, from the surface. You're going to be scorched to death. But the Soviets said they had it all worked out because they planned to go at night when the, <laughs> when the sun doesn't shine. And so, um, well, well, the 93, 9 billion miles of our solar system is, is huge, or 7.4, whatever size you're looking at. Look at the next slide. We, we also need to realize that we are part of a larger, a larger sphere called the Milky Way galaxy. How many of you heard of the Milky Way galaxy? How many of you like frozen Milky Way? There you go. I just want to make sure. So you've got to realize that that is huge. And when we get that large, we start using a different measure. We use a measure to measure distances. We start talking about something called light years. So the age-old question, who's faster? Superman or? Don't know, don't know. They raced one time in a DC comic book. I don't know if you realize who won here. But light travels fast. Now, I want to tell you how fast light travels. It travels so fast. If you go one Mississippi, 
How far did the light just travel? Because it traveled 186,000 miles per what? Second. Do you hear what I said? Second. The diameter of the earth is 25,000 miles around the equator. 25,000 miles. I don't know if you realize that. That the earth rotates one times in what? 24 hours. So let's say you're here in 24 hours. You just traveled what? 25,000 miles. Right now we are racing more than 1,000 miles per hour, just so you know that. You're moving right now. So when, when your wife says, honey, get moving, just say, I'm moving real quick, baby. I'm moving. You just don't see it. It's going so fast. Not only that, I'm going around the sun, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, because you're really moving, guys. Just say, easy, girl. So as we do, we got to stop and say, if this is 25,000 miles, right, in circumference, and we shot a beam of light, got it, got it, that light does this. It goes around one time, that's how many miles? Second time, we're getting the math here. Third time, fourth time, has it been a second yet? Not yet. Fifth time, sixth time, seventh time, 175. It goes 186,000 miles. It's going to go around the earth seven and a half times about in how long? One second, exactly. So the question is, what is a light year? Is a light year a measure of distance? Is a light year a measure of time? Or is it a measure of light intensity? Share with the person next to you what you think a light year is. Time's up. You got to make a commitment. If you said A, you're right. If you said B, you're a loser. No, you're not. You're okay. You're not a loser. You're just wrong. Here we go. If you said A is the measure of distance, that's correct. A light year is a measure of distance, yes. Because a light year is the distance a light would travel in what? One year. We already know how, fa how far it travels in a second, correct? So pop up the next slide. Me being the physics teacher that I used to be, I like doing stuff like this. So if light travels 186 miles per second, don't you hate these? We call these word problems, and you go, oh, I hate word problems. If light travels 186 miles per second, how far would the light travel in what? One year. Well, you got 186 miles per second, 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes an hour, 24 hours in a day, 365 days in a year. You got to realize the seconds cancel with the seconds, the minutes cancel with the minutes, the hours cancel with the hours, the days cancel with the days, and you have miles per what? Year, just so you know that's how you do that. And if you like doing science, I do. The answer you get is about six trillion. Now that's a big number. That's a big number. So a light year is how far? About what? Six trillion miles. This is a measure of distance. It's a measure of distance. That's how far would light would travel in one year. Now, no one ever says, you know, the word trillion. You might say, hey, thanks a million. Oh, yeah? Well. I like you more. Thanks a trillion. Yeah, yeah. Hey, thanks a quadrillion. Yeah, thanks a, I don't know. So <laughs> you got to realize it's a big number. We're getting, we're getting big numbers. So light years are bigger than big numbers. And so if you got A, you are correct. Now, the reason we use light years is because the universe is so huge that you got to realize whenever they say they use universe, just go times. Six trillion miles, and you get it, all right? If you like, you just go times six trillion. If you work better than light years, I understand that. Well, let's get back to our Milky Way galaxy. Remember, our solar system is 7.4 billion uh, miles in diameter. Our Milky Way galaxy has a diameter of 125 light years. That's 125 thousand, excuse me, 125,000, 125,000 times what? Six trillion. Is it broken yet? 
Is your brain broken? Hear what I'm saying? I mean, how big that is? How vast that is? It's just huge. And so that's why you have the handout. You have the handout so you can remember these numbers uh, when you have a dialogue. Our Milky Way galaxy is a giant uh, spiral rotated in space, kind of like a pinwheel. Our sun is one star, one star. Our planetary system is right there in this Milky Way galaxy. And so there's a question somebody would say, are there other planetary systems? Are there other solar systems? Are there other gravitationally bound planets going around a sun? The answer is yes. They believe there's 2,500 planetary systems within here. You gotta realize, there's 200, 200 to 400 billion stars in our galaxy alone. I think that's great. Is that big enough? We're going bigger. Next slide. There was a guy, there's our Milky Way. Hold on, stop. So when you look up, how many of you guys have seen the Milky Way galaxy? Do you realize that you are part of what you're looking at? Have you recognized that? When you see the galaxy, you're actually part of this galaxy. You were just in one location looking at a different location. Isn't that crazy? Boop, 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 boop. Circuit breakers start popping, at least in my mind. Well, there was a gentleman by the name of Hubble, and Edwin Hubble, and uh, the, he was involved in developing this uh, optical base, or this optical base telescope was named after Edwin um, Hubble. It was launched in 1990, and uh, it went out into space uh, to start taking pictures. Uh, it's taken more than uh, 1.3 million pictures. But it not that it's traveling to stars or to planets or to galaxies. It actually orbits our Earth. So it's one of the satellites that orbits our Earth. You've got to realize, for anything to orbit our Earth, it needs to maintain a speed of somewhere around 17,000 miles per second. Excuse me, per hour. And so that's pretty fast. If, if, from our 17,000 to 17,500. If it goes faster, well, what? leave our gravitational pull. If it goes slower, it's going to what? Fall down into Earth or be burned up into the atmosphere, depending on how that might happen. It's amazing because once you're out of the haze of the atmosphere, uh, the astronomical objects can be seen with pinpoint accuracy, clarity, and they've been able to learn a lot about our universe. Here's the next slide. You look at this next slide. It doesn't look very impressive. It looks like splattered paint along a black wall. But if you were to look up in the sky and you see the size of the moon in the sky, right? For every patch of moon in the sky that you're looking at, what you're actually seeing is about a million, ready? A million galaxies. A million galaxies. You hear what I just said? Milky Way, now looking at a million galaxies. It is estimated there's 125 billion galaxies in the observable universe. All different straights. Our closest one is the Andromeda Galaxy, which is 2.6 million light years away. 2.6 million times six what? Trillion light years away. That now makes up what we call our universe. Astronomy 101 has now ended. Got it? In that context, let's go and just realize that we want to read verse 14 through 19 one more time. Then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and for years. That's why we have, guys, these lights is to help us to, to see them as signs and seasons and days and years. And let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give them light on the earth. And it was so. Then God made two great lights the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light to the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And so the evening and the morning were the fourth day. We saw back there in Genesis 1-4 that God divided the light from the darkness. He called the light day and he called the darkness night. That was early there. On the first day, he did that. We then realized that uh, things, he, he divided the waters on day two, and on day two, he divided the waters, and so we had the earth, and you had 
the waters above and the waters below. We have the atmosphere. And now we're talking about outer space or planetary space. He made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule uh, the night. And so we see that that's exactly what they're going to be there for. We know that it's daytime because we see the, the light of the day. And then it says, uh, and nighttime because we see the light of the moon. And then we says, and he made the stars also. It's important to realize what is being said there because the word stars is kohaf. It actually refers to anything that's round or shiny. And so in context, when you look up and you see a shiny object in the sky, we say the same thing. Look at all the what? Stars. Well, you might be looking at a planet. You might be looking at something else. But you normally say, look at all the what? Stars. You guys have done that. You'd be sitting there looking at the stars, and all of a sudden you see something. Whew, and you, I just saw a... No, you didn't see a shooting star. You saw a meteor falling into the atmosphere being burned up. Oh, I just saw a meteor being burned up. That doesn't sound the same. Let's make a wish on the meteor being burned up. It, does, it doesn't do it. It, does, it, does, it doesn't have the same effect. There's no love there. Show some love. If that meteor doesn't get all burned up and falls to the earth and you pick it up, you say that's called a meteorite. Meteorite is a meteor that made it to the earth. Got it? Most of them are being burned up all the time. We do the same thing, though. We call them all stars. You go and you go, look, the star's moving. It's still moving. It's still moving. Sometimes you go, I see a red light blinking. But sometimes you, but sometimes you don't see it, and you go, it's moving. Well, you may have just saw what? A satellite, a man-made object orbiting the earth. I mean, you've seen this, right? You can actually get the app and put your, your iPad or your pad up there and check it, and you can go, oh, that's such and such. You know, you give all the information about it when it was launched and everything else. So then it says in verse 14, then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. So God now places and he, 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 he makes a... Uh, a change uh, in which we're going to have new light bearers. Before God just spoke the light into existence, but now he, we are now going to have a way that lights are going to be forever in there based upon two new objects. And what's their purpose? It says in verse 15, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And so it was so it said the same thing in verse 17 to give light on the earth earth. So here's one of the questions. What is the purpose of the sun and the moon and the stars? To be new light bearers, to give light upon the earth, to continue to divide the day and the night. That's one of the answers that you need to realize. If you walk outside, you see the sun, you go, oh, it's daytime. You go outside, you see the moon, you go, oh, it's nighttime. And that's one of the reasons that we can differentiate the day from the night. But verse 14 says a very important thing, and that's going to spend the rest of my talk uh, discussion about let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. Now, I want to talk about first for the days and years on, the, on here. We guys, you realize that the earth, when it rotates one time, how many hours is that? We call that a what? A day. In other words, a day is based upon an astronomical event that happens. Got that. When the moon goes around the earth one time, we call that a what? A month. M moon's very important. Makes high tides and low tides. If you're an ab diver, that's very important information. You want to go when? Low tide. Yeah, pick those abs. When it's legal. Here we go. <laughs> when they open the season again. Can I hear who, who, all ab divers? Here we go. So that's it's, a month is another astronomical event. When the earth rotates around the sun, we call that a what? Another astronomical event. Isn't that amazing? The order that God has put for man, for Adam, for Eve, for you and I to work. In other words, <laughs> let's say we didn't have these astronomical events. And you say, hey, Brad, Angel, when did you get married? We got married a long time ago. How long? 
How many days? What's a day? What's a month? What's a year? Those are based upon astronomical. So here's one of the questions. What is the purpose of the sun moving the stars? There we go. It was a way for Adam and for you and I to chronicle days, months, and years. It actually provided a what? A basis for a calendar system. God's doing things so man can now function in an orderly way. It's not some haphazard thing that was done. We see this unique planetary position that's given us a wonderful uh, design to mark time. Uh, we, we know you can put a sundial up and you can put a sundial, and a sundial will tell you what time of the day it is. You don't need a watch or anything of that nature at nighttime. Look in the sundial. It's not working. Okay. So we know we have these lights in our, in our sky to be uh, differentiate day and night to help us with a calendar system. But question, don't pop it up there yet. Is there an astronomical reason to determine a week? If not, tell your friend next to you or apart or behind from you. What is the reason we have a week in our calendar system? Go ahead. Here we go. Time's up. I find this stuff exciting. Do you find this exciting? I dig this stuff. Here we go. The reason to pop it up here now, a week is totally biblically based on the creation week. There's no astronomical reason that we have a week. The reason we have a week is because of the Bible. We have a week because on the seventh day, God alone ended his work, and then he started back up on a new day. That's the basis for a week. That is the reason you can answer people for them. Well, then it says, and let them be for signs and for seasons. The word sign means a, a signal or a distinguishing mark, a banner, uh, a remembrance. You got to realize when the people would navigate back then, either on land or on sea, a lot of times they used an instrument called a sexton. A lot of times they would have to know the astronomical events, what's happening by using the stars. And they could find their way. You got to realize when Columbus navigated the oceans and came over, he, he used it by using an astronomical chart and a sextant and figured out how he's able to get from point A to point B. And you got a compass. We're a magnet, the Earth is. You can figure out what North is, line up with the North Stars, know a couple constellations, mark where you're going, and know how long it's going to take you to get there. Pretty amazing. Do people still do that today? The answer is yes. There was a whole uh, uh, thing I went online to try to find and uh, pop up the little picture there with the, with the ship. How to navigate the ocean using what? Stars. Know your constellation. Find the North Star. Find the Southern Cross. Determine or find east and west. Determine your latitude and then calculate your what? Your longitude. So here's a question. So what are the sun, moon, and stars to be assigned for? I think definitely a way to navigate, to move, to direct people in their lives. Again, to give order, to give direction so we know which way to go, when, what things are happening, when they're happening. I think they're also to be assigned for, for something else. Psalm 19.1 says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament or the expanse shows his handiwork. Amen? I think one of the greatest things that I love to do when I'm camping is just go look at the what? Stars. Get away from the lights and just look at that. Next time you're going to look, you're going to go, see that? There's, I don't know what number, but a bunch of billion galaxies right out there. <laughs> it's big. We're, we're so tiny. But God is so huge. And you see the handiwork of God and the order of God and the love of God and the power of God. It says in Psalm 147, 4, he counts the numbers of the stars. He calls them by name. He knows every light ball that's shining out there. He created them. He has a name for each one of them. Isaiah 40, 26 says, lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number. He calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might and by the strength of his power, not 
one is missing. You see, these, these planetary objects, these stars, the sun and the moon, are up there for a distinguishing mark, for a banner, for a remembrance, I think for a testimony, definitely, of the handiwork of God. So what is the sun, the moon, and the stars a sign for? I put to declare the incredible handiwork of God, to, to look at the total awesomeness, the vastness of his creation, to see the greatness of his might, the strength of his power. If you don't leave with anything else this morning, I want you to realize that our God is bigger than all that. Our God created all of that. And in that context, what I'm going through is very, very, very little, and he's big enough to handle it. So come to him in prayer. Lord, I got this issue. I, 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 got, I got some problems. I got some finances. We're moving. We need to sell this. We, we got some health issues, Lord. I come to you. You're a big God, and he cares for you. He's put us in such a unique place in this world. It's just phenomenal. Do you know how unique we are being on this planet Earth? I mean, Brad, so if there are other planetary uh, systems out there, other solar systems out there, could be, be life on other planets. Good question, right? A life as we know it. Of course, it could be whatever life we might want to make up. But I want you to know that it takes certain things to sustain life as we know it on a planet. And I hit through uh, 12 different point bullets that I kind of uh, did some research on. Number one, you need to have a planet like our Earth in the perfect position in the solar system in the galaxy to support life. The ball that we're on as it circles the sun is able to keep water in a state called liquid. If you have, if you have liquid water in the state of gas, if you're just a few more degrees this way, our liquid is too hot and it all becomes a water vapor. Got it? And it's not going to work. If you go too far this way to the outward, our water becomes what? frozen, and it's not available. So the earth has to be in the perfect position where God has put us in. Number two, the planet needs to be orbiting the right size star, not to impress you, but our sun is a spectral type G2 dwarf main sequence star. I have no idea what that means. I just wrote it down, okay? If that means something to you, then good. Um, but it, what it means is it's just the right size star it, it, to provide the right amount of heat that we need. If it was smaller, uh, the earth would have to be closer. If it's closer, it's probably going to be pulled into the gravitational pull. And there's just so many other mathematical complications. It's just the right size star. Number three, the planet needs to be protected by the giant planets, gas planets within the solar system. We talked about Jupiter and, and, and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune all the way out there, right? These are huge planets. Asteroids coming in or, or meteors coming in are normally pulled into the gravitational pull and goes into those bottom gas planets. And we are protected. This Earth is incredibly protected where it's located. Number four, the planet needs to have a, a nearly circular orbit, which a lot of the planets don't, which means that if you have the sun here, it needs to go in a somewhat of a circular path. We have a little bit of an elliptical path. But if it's too far out like this, then we, we freeze. You got it? If it comes in too close, we got, what, too hot. And so it's got to have some kind of a circular orbit like the Earth does. Um, uh, Mercury, Mars, uh, Pluto do not have, uh, they do have uh, elliptical uh, orbits also. A planet needs to be an oxygen-rich atmosphere, which we have, that provides a tip or a climate. It also protects us from any radiation. There are 70 um, uh, known planetary bodies within our solar system. Um, and of those, only seven of them, 10%, have an atmosphere. And of those seven, only Earth has an atmosphere that can sustain life. The rest do not. So that's zero out of all of them on in our, in our planetary space. With just that one atmosphere question alone. A planet needs to be orbited by a large moon. Again, our moon is larger than Pluto. It's about one-fourth the size of Earth. Being a smaller, it also has a gravitational pull. So if you ever want to set a high-jumping record, do it on Mars, because you can get up and go a lot higher, because there's less gravity pull at that time. If you're a pole vaulter, come down. 
you got to realize, uh, it's the moon that, that, that does the ocean tides, does the hydraulic cycle, uh, keeps the earth tilted on its axis. We'll talk about the earth axis. Number seven, the planet needs to have a magnetic field. Our earth liquid core uh, allows, uh, shields this magnetic field around our earth, shields us from a lot of solar radiation. Number eight, the planet needs to have a, th a relatively thin crust with tectonic movement. Uh, this is, occurs, it helps the crust um, and old crust move. It does actually a, a temperature regulation of our planet and a chemical replenishing. Number nine, a planet needs to have the proper ratio of liquid bodies of water and land. That helps our water cycle. Number 10, a planet needs to have land, a terrestrial planet. Saturn and Jupiter are all gases. Number 11, a planet needs to have a moderate rate of rotation so that you get somewhat warmth and somewhat cool, like a nice rotisserie, rotisserie chicken, just right going around there. And number 12, a planet sun needs to be located in the proper spot in the galaxy. If it's too close to the, to the, the pool, it could pull and mess up all the different things that we talked about. The odds of that happening, they say, are very rare. Uh, they're about one of a trillionth or even smaller than that. We're very rare. In other words, the takeaway is this. God placed us on this planet Earth that he created it specifically for life and for you and I to inhabit. It's not an accident. It can't be an accident. Now, I'm just talking about the earth and the location. I'm not talking about how the Big Bang. I'm not talking about the single cell. I'm not talking about any of that stuff. I'm just talking about one thing, where we're physically located and how we live at one area there. And the final thing is, um, as some people say, well, Brad, it says that it was supposed to be a sign. Could that be an astrological sign? No. There's a difference between astronomy and astrology. Astronomy is a science. It researches and it observes um, everything outside of the Earth's atmosphere, the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, the celestial bodies. But astrology is not a science. It, it, it's, it's from the pit of hell. It is a belief that the position of the stars and the relationship with one another and planets can impact affect, or even predict uh, our event. So I would not have you do horoscopes or anything of the zodiac. In fact, God condemns it. In Isaiah 47, he says in verse 13, you are wearied in the multitude of your counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, and the monthly prognosticators, that's a big word, stand up and save you from what shall come upon you. Behold, they shall be a stubble. For fires to burn. And the final thing it says, let them be for signs and seasons. If you know what seasons and how come seasons are about, that's great. If not, watch this video. Winter, spring, summer, fall. Seasons. I just love them all. Other than inspiring me to make up goofy poetry, why wouldn't you love the seasons? There's always something to look forward to. You already know that summer means long days of fun in the sun, and winter means shorter days, not to mention building snowmen and making lots of frozen references. Okay, so clearly the sun and seasons are linked. But how? You already know that the sun is pretty important. It is the center of the solar system, after all. You also know that our planet, Earth, revolves around the sun, making its orbit once every 365 days. And remember, Earth isn't taking that lap while it's standing straight up and down. Instead, it's tilted on its axis, the invisible line around which our planet spins. Put together, the Earth's tilt on its axis and the orbit it makes around the sun, and you get the yearly pattern we call seasons. Let's see how. Since the Earth is tilted, for part of the year, one of the hemispheres, which is half of the Earth, is leaning toward the Sun, and the other part of the year, it's leaning away. Let's follow the Northern Hemisphere once around the Sun to see how this works. In June, the Northern Hemisphere is tilted towards the Sun. This means that it's getting a lot of direct sunlight, light that's hitting it straight on. If you've ever sat directly underneath a bulb, you know that things can get pretty hot, and that's exactly what's happening to the Northern Hemisphere. It's summertime and the living is easy, temperatures are warm and days are long. In December, though, the northern hemisphere is tilted away from the sun. It's getting indirect sunlight, meaning light is hitting it at an angle. Indirect sunlight means cooler temperatures, shorter days, and, for lots of folks, hot cocoa and bundling up since it's winter. But how can the angle of the sun's light make a difference between hot and cold? 
Well, try this little trick with a flashlight. Get a flashlight and dim the lights in your room a little bit. If you turn the flashlight on and point it straight down onto your desk, you'll see a small, bright, concentrated circle of light. That's kind of how sunlight hits the northern hemisphere during the summer. Bright and intense. Now move the flashlight down at an angle and point it at the top of your desk. See how the light isn't as bright and is less intense where it falls? That's like the sunlight we get in winter. But what about spring and autumn? During these two seasons, the Earth's orbit causes the northern hemisphere to be neither tilted toward the sun nor away from it. So temperatures during the spring and fall are more moderate, not too hot and not too cold, since the entire globe is getting about the same amount of direct sunlight at once. Now, let's take a look at how the amount of sunlight affects temperatures in the northern hemisphere over the course of a whole year. An easy way to show this yearly pattern is by using a graph. This graph shows the average high temperature in each month for one year in Toronto, Canada, where I live. Looking at the graph, we see that during December, January, and February, when the northern hemisphere is getting very little direct sunlight, temperatures are low. And in the months of June, July, and August, when the tilt of the Earth on its axis is causing Toronto to get direct sunlight, the temperatures are much higher. Proof positive that something is going on here, and that something is this. The season that you're experiencing right this very minute is caused in part by the amount of direct sunlight you're getting. So, seasons are caused by the Earth's tilt on its axis as it cruises around the sun in its orbit. When one hemisphere gets more direct sunlight, it's summer there. Temperatures are warmer, days are longer, and nights are shorter. And when it gets more indirect sunlight, it's winter. Temperatures are cooler, days are shorter, and nights are longer. And now you know what causes summer, spring, autumn, and winter. Winter, spring, so as you continue also to um, orbit the sun, you will also see different star constellations. And in knowing the different star constellations, you'll know what season you're in. You'll know when it's time to plant, when it's time to harvest, when certain activities are going to be going. And so the seasons were set up also so that would give man information what to do. So how is the sun, moon, and the stars to be for us as seasons? Well, people would look at the constellations. They'll know, hey, we got a festival coming up. We have a appointed time to plant the grain, to harvest certain things. It's set for man for order in their lives. And I just think, praise God, what an incredible God that we live. To, to care about you and I, to create a solar system, to create um, uh, galaxies uh, that will then navigate and control every aspect of our lives, from our calendar to when it is time to worship the Lord if you have certain days that are set aside and looking at, oh, we know that Easter is coming. We know that certain things are approaching. What an incredible God. I just want you to make sure that we don't worship the creation. We worship what? the Creator. He put it all in there. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you all that you did and the application it means to each one of us here on day four. I pray if there's anyone here who doesn't know you as your Lord and Savior, they realize, my goodness, there is a powerful God, and I'm accountable to that God. Here's the good news. Jesus Christ came to die for your sins, to take your sins upon him, that we can have a relationship with the creator of, of all this, an intimate relationship. We just need to say, Lord, forgive me. Lord Jesus, come into my life. If there's anyone here that would like to do that this morning, lift up your hand. If you're watching online, just say, I want to see the Lord Jesus. If there's anyone here that's going through a difficult time and you, or you need some wisdom and some direction or you just want the body right now, some health or something, to pray for you. Look up, put your hand up. Is there anyone here this morning? Thank you, sis. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thank you, guys, way back there. Thank you over here on the side. Thank you, brother. Amen, sis, back there over here. Amen. Well, amen. Well, God, let's pray for each other. Father, we just pray, Lord, that you would just do that work within our lives. Some of us are going through some difficulties. God, let us see that, that when we look up into heaven, we see your handiwork. We see how big you are. And God, when we see that you had your son come and die for me, you realize how much you love us, God. Father, we give you our concerns. We give you our, our lives. We pray for wisdom and direction and things that always come up. And we, God, we know that you care for us. So we ask that you bless the rest of this day and this week. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.